Blog Talk Radio. Hello, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. We have a great show this evening, an interesting show, uh, very thought provocative. I'm going to nail some things square on this evening, hopefully to bring a better understanding of what is going on in the outside world. I want to start this week with what is going on in New York City, the war between the PBA and Mayor de Blasio. Okay, here's the way it goes. I look at this whole situation, the PBA against the mayor, as rank insubordination. You heard me, rank insubordination on the part of the police officers. I think they're wrong, and the mayor is right. I have written a detailed column on this, by the way, that will appear in this week's Conk Life, which comes out, it hits the stands tomorrow night at 5 o'clock. Uh, and it's called Rank and Subordination. The PBA is led by its president, a fellow by the name of Lynch. And Lynch and the PBA have been doing some very strange things and not normal what they're doing. They have referred to the mayor as having blood on his hands. They turn their back on the mayor whenever he speaks publicly or passes them by, turns their back on the mayor. And they're involved now in work slowdowns and work stoppages. Since December 22nd, traffic tickets are down 94%. Summonses for minor crimes, summonses for minor crimes are also down 94%. Parking tickets are down 92%. And the one that scares me the most is arrests are down 66%. Arrests are down 66%. I view the mayor as the president of the United States. The president of the United States is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. He is the civilian head of the armed forces. The mayor of New York City is the civilian head of the police department. They answer to him. He's the boss. Now, there is no right for police to strike. They haven't gone out on strike. This was established way back in the early 1920s by Calvin Coolidge uh, when he was governor of Massachusetts and the Boston police, uh, police officers went on strike. He, he cut it down right away. No public right to strike. Uh, more importantly, though, and the thing that hits this thing right on the bullseye is what President Reagan did with the air controllers. You recall, it was the early 1980s, Reagan had just taken office. The air controllers decided to go on strike. They were federal employees. They were federal civil service. Reagan says, go back to work. You are civil servants. You work for the public. Public employees have no right to strike. He said, I am giving you 48 hours. If you don't go back to work within 48 hours, you are fired. And what did he do? He fired 11,000 air controllers. That's the number, 11,000, and none of them got their jobs back. Now, you can't, what the police officers in New York are doing, they're smart. They're not going out on strike. There's a law against striking in New York State. It's been on the books for over 50 years. It's called the Taylor Law. And what it says, basically, there is that, number one, unions for public servants are only set up for purposes of collective bargaining, not to strike or stop working. The Taylor Law covers civil service employees. The 35,000 New York City police officers are civil servants. Uh, They're civil employees. And the Taylor Law basically says that strikes and work stoppages, work slowdowns, are prohibited, are prohibited. And if the police officers do this at the behest of the head of their union, the PBA, the officers are subject to arrest criminal prosecution, and the individual members of the PBA, that means the 35,000 police officers in New York City, will be fined $2 for every dollar they earn while they did this dastardly thing. Pretty strong. The mayor has not invoked the Taylor Law. He has not asked for the Taylor Law yet. 
He is trying to get this matter resolved, I assume, as quietly as possible. But you can't deal with a mad dog. And the PBA is off on a tangent. They're behaving like a mad dog. The underlying thing that's involved in this whole matter also, and what the paper does not seem, the media does not seem to report enough, is that at the present time, and when this whole thing started, the PBA and the mayor have been in negotiations, the PBA mayor and the city of New York, over a new contract for the police officers. They have been working for several months, the police officers, without a new contract because they can't agree on the details of the contract. And it is thought in many quarters, it is thought in many quarters, that the Lynch and the PBA are using the death of the two police officers on December 20th as a negotiation tool. And by turning their back on the mayor, by saying he has blood on his hands, by having work stoppages and slowdowns, remember arrests down to 66%, that they're going to force his hand to enter into a favorable contractual relationship with them. Well, I think the officers are wrong. I've said it already here. I think they're rogue cops. They're usurping the mayor's authority. This, this whole thing must stop. This is absolutely ridiculous. Government isn't run this way. Police departments don't take control of situations in their hands as these police officers are. They are police officers are there to enforce the law. They themselves are in violation of the Taylor Law. All right? Now, the only way this thing's going to be resolved is in one of two ways. Mayor de Blasio has to give in or he has to take control of the situation. I think the mayor isn't going to give in. I think this guy's like Pope Francis. He's doing a hell of a job so far. Uh, he's going to take control, and chips are going to fall where they may. That's the way it is. Now, and there's a basic thing here. We've heard the saying, the tail cannot wag the dog. When the police department is telling the mayor what to do, that is the tail wagging the dog. I want to stay with the police officers for a few months longer. Uh, and because we know all over this country for the past several years, there have been shootings and killings, blacks, some whites, by police officers, no indictments generally, no convictions. Uh, police officers are running wild lately. Uh, they, they got, they're militarized with all this fantastic equipment. Uh, and I think since 9-11, they've been told by the federal authorities, you are our first line of defense against terrorism, and you must do what you must do, no screwing around. And they're taking this very, very seriously. They're extending it into everyday police matters like husband and wife fights and things of that nature. I want to go right now to Damascus, Maryland, because what happened to Damascus Maryland could have happened in Damascus. Things go on like this in the real Damascus. In Damascus, Maryland, there was a home birthday party for a 21-year-old. The son was turning 21. His parents were there. His brother was there. Uh, and friends between 18 and 21 years of age. Uh, most were 21. A few were under 21. The drinking age in Maryland is 21. Beer was being served. A pizza delivery man uh, went to deliver pizzas. Sounds like an ordinary all-American party, pizzas and beer. Went to deliver pizzas. And afterwards, he called a police friend of his and said to the police officer, I think there are kids over there drinking beer, underage drinking, which is a big crime in Damascus, Maryland. And so uh, the police officers went. Two police officers went, not the fellow he called, but they called two sheriff's deputies who went and visited the house. These sheriff's deputies did not have a search warrant. They didn't have a warrant for anything. Their only reason to be there was a phone call to another police officer from the pizza delivery man who said, I think. All right. The police officers walked on the back of the property. They had absolutely no right to walk on the property, period, if they did not have a warrant. And they said they saw, they thought, I think they said, someone taking a piss, if you'll excuse me, behind the garage. 
They also saw a lot of cars in the neighborhood, and they could hear the sounds of a party coming out of the house. Well, there was a party. They assumed, they did not know, they assumed there was underage drinking, and they called for reinforcements. They didn't even go up to the door themselves, these two guys. They called for reinforcements. Well, (laughs) the reinforcements came. They went up to the house. They wanted to gain admission. They knocked on the door. The parents said, no way. We're having a birthday party. Get out of here. You guys are off base. We're not going to let you in our house. The police officers saw a keg of beer and cases of beer. So they entered the house without permission, and they started carrying the beer out and putting it on the porch. They were going to take the whole, all the beer away. The parents continued to say, no, this is wrong. You shouldn't be doing it. The father and a police officer got into a fight. Uh, when, the police, uh, when the father tried to take a case of beer from the police officer, there was a struggle. The, other, the, son got, the two sons got involved. The wife got involved. Some of the ki- other people at the party got involved. And before you know it, the police officers were using their tasers. They were tasering people. All right? Now, in the meantime, some of the other reinforcements thought that some of these people at the party, underage children, were hiding in the cellar. So they got a battering ram. And they broke down the cellar door. And there was nobody down there, of course. Now, just about everyone in this world today has a cell phone. And all of these people had cell phones. And what were they doing with them? They were recording this whole thing. They were making a video of it, recording the conversations, what was being said. The police officers got upset. And they confiscated all of the cell phones. Now, they arrest the mother, they arrest the father, they arrest the two sons with all kinds of charges. I won't even itemize them for you. Anything you can think of, they charged them with. Too much. In any event, five hours after this whole thing is concluded, the parents are in jail. Five hours afterwards, the two police officers who started this whole thing went to a judge and got a search warrant. They didn't bother telling the judge that the episode had already occurred that they had people arrested. They said, we have information, which we believe is probable cause, a pizza delivery man called Officer so-and-so and told him that there was underage drinking. We went and we saw cars in the neighborhood, a lot of cars parked. We could hear sounds of a party going on in the house, and we assumed underage drinking, okay? Five hours afterwards. Now, this is sort of fraudulent. This is lying. Anyhow, the judge gave him a search warrant. What did he know? When they finally went to court, uh, these four family members who were charged with everything under the sun, the family got a lawyer, spent some money, and they fought the case. The trial judge threw all the charges out. He dismissed all the charges against this family. He says, hey, there's a blatant Fourth Amendment violation. There was no search warrant. There was no probable cause. The pizza delivery man is in probable cause. Therefore, there was no right to be on the premises, okay? And you obtain the search warrant five hours after the event occurred. And he also said, basically, that the family in their home have a right to privacy, which was violated by the police officers. The judge also went on to say that he thought the police testimony, some of it, not all of it, some of it was not true. Would you wonder? Now, would you believe this? The state attorney here who prosecuted the case is considering an appeal. He is considering an appeal on these facts and this court decision. And more importantly, the police officers who were involved, none of them have been disciplined. Now, I want to stay with this police uh, thing and their exercise of power, uh, brutality. I'm going to use that term, killings. I'm going to use that term. And I want, I believe this. I wrote this in my blog. I write a daily blog, and I wrote this in my blog a couple of weeks ago. I believe violence begets violence. You hit somebody, they're going to want to hit you back. Violence begets violence. 
Now we are in Dallas, Texas. I don't know how to say this. You're not going to believe it. A Black Panthers organization has been established. You recall the Black Panthers back in the 1960s. Uh, They were against the Vietnam War because the blacks were going, not the whites. They were opposed uh, not only to the war, they were opposed to what they considered abusive treatment by policemen. We didn't have the civil rights laws under Johnson, the new laws passed yet. And they formed their, their own little group of black panthers, and they did bad things, these guys. They blew up buildings. They killed police officers. They killed people. They went to the extreme as they felt the police officers had gone against them. Well, there's a new group that's been formed, and I'm not, they're not quite the same, but they are the same in a sense. This group of Black Panthers that's been formed recently in Dallas consists of former Army Rangers. we got trained guys here, former, former Army Rangers and some other citizens. They, they wear military attire, and they carry assault rifles, which they all know how to use, okay? They are, in effect, a paramilitary group. And they're doing this, they say, in response to police brutality. Their purpose is self-defense. You're killing our people. You shouldn't be doing it. This is against the police department down there. They formed a local club. The Black Panthers is going national. It started in Dallas. The Dallas chapter is called the UEP Newton Gun Club. Uh, For uh, those of you who are as old as me, UEP Newton was the head of the Black Panthers back in the 1960s. Uh, And not a nice guy. Now, what's interesting is, do they need this in Dallas? Is it warranted, this type of group? Well, would you believe that the Dallas County District Attorney, the man required to prosecute the law, the Dallas County District Attorney said, and I quote, they have an absolute right to do what they do, unquote. That doesn't mean that their premise is correct, but what they're doing, forming this group, carrying guns, don't you love the NRA, carry guns, everybody can carry guns, they're doing it all right. And he says they're not violating any laws. Now, why did they do this in Dallas, the the fellows in Dallas, the the veterans and so forth, the black veterans? In the past 12 years, the past 12 years, the Dallas police have shot and killed over 70 unarmed individuals. Shot and killed over 70 unarmed individuals, mostly black and Hispanic. In addition, the grand jury process seems to suck down there. In fact, it sucks all over the country when it comes to these police shootings. No police officer who has shot an unarmed individual and killed him. There have been no indictments since 1973. Can it be not just once, only one time? Couldn't the policemen have been wrong? No, since 19, that's over 40 years ago. In 40 years, no indictments. Now, these fellows aren't stupid that formed the Black Panthers. I told you, they are retired Army Rangers. They are sophisticated uh, fighters and soldiers. They're using knives, yes, because they believe a knife changes the whole game. All troops joining the Black Panthers in Dallas are trained to perform slash and stab maneuvers. Doesn't sound good. Slash and stab maneuvers, but this is how they're going to handle things. This is not, again, a ragtail group. These are, these are intelligent people. They're not stupid. And they're trained already by the United States government when they were Army uh, Rangers. Interestingly, they're getting a ton of money, not from people just in Dallas, from all over the country. They are receiving contributions to better organize, train, and proceed. I'm going to stay with policemen a little bit more, and I'm going to go, this is the last one, though. But these are interesting things. They're timely topics. They're sensitive issues. I'm going to go back to Ferguson, Missouri, where all this stuff started several months ago. One of the grand jurors, you remember the grand jury sat for, what, over 70 days? They heard 60-some-odd hours of testimony. 
And then the, the, the prosecutor went on television for over 20 minutes, and he said what happened. There were no indictments, and he told this whole story. I've never, in 46 years of practicing law, I never saw a prosecutor do that anywhere. All right? And uh, one of the grand jurors uh, in this Ferguson thing says as follows. By the way, he started a lawsuit yesterday, Monday. He started a lawsuit in Missouri. He wants the grand jury minutes revealed. He wants them printed and issued so the public can read the, read the minutes for themselves. Because this juror, he was on the grand jury, he says the prosecutor, and this is his word, mischaracterized, wow, the case. And he said the prosecutor, and I quote, was not entirely accurate. He wants to tell his side. He wants the public to know. He thinks the public should see what went on in that grand jury room because what came out ain't the way it was with, uh, with regard to all matters. He also says as the legal grounds for doing this. That, see, grand jury minutes have been secret forever. It's, I know from practicing law, it's absolutely impossible to find out what went on in a grand jury room. You're not entitled to ask a grand juror what went on. Uh, very, very secret. Only the prosecutor knows, the district attorney, and the judge if he reads the minutes. And whenever you attack an indictment because you said there wasn't sufficient evidence before the grand jury, you were guessing and you had to surmise. It, these minutes are inviolate. Forever it's been that way. He says, no. He's breaking new ground, this guy. He says, I have a right to free speech, and the public has a right to know. I want to speak as to what I think was reported wrong, and I think the public has the right, right to know what went on in that grand jury room so they can make their own judgment as to the accuracy of the prosecutor's report. And that's the lawsuit that's pending. The American Civil Liberties Union is representing this grand juror. It's going to be interesting. Let me say this. Let me give you my thought on what's going to happen. I think it's one of the hardest chores in the world. It's one of the most difficult things to accomplish to invade the secrecy of the grand jury chamber. It's a total uphill battle with a steep incline. I don't think this grand juror is going to come out on top, but you never know. We're done with policemen tonight, folks. Now we're going to move on to Venezuela. Venezuela was a pretty good place to live when Hugo Chavez was president. We didn't like Chavez. Chavez didn't like people in the United States or the United States. He hated Bush, Bush too. He said he smelled like the devil when he spoke before the U.N. Uh, but Chavez took care of his people as best he could. When he came, became president, and you have to appreciate that the, they make money off oil. Venezuela has some of the largest oil deposits in the world, and everybody was there, Esso, Mobil, all the big companies, BP. And when he became president, he says, hey, you're taking the oil up. You've got your factories processing it. We don't get enough for this. So he nationalized the whole oil industry, kicked these guys out, took it over, ran it himself, and kept the money for his people. Not only did he keep the money for his people, during his term as president, he issued a check every month, month to each and every citizen. He gave a little piece of the action. Of course, their state and life improved. Not terrifically, but much better than before. The people liked him. Uh, well, Chavez died of cancer, as you know, a couple of years ago. They've got a new president. His name's Maduro, M-A-D-U-R-O. I have said many times in the last two years in writing and on the show, I don't know why the people keep him in office. They should have had a rebellion by now down there because elections aren't straight. Here's what happened. Two years ago, if you recall, they had a toilet paper shortage. Everybody laughed, but it was for real. They still have a toilet paper shortage. I'm laughing as I say. Think of your life without toilet paper. They don't have toilet paper. Uh, someone's lucky, a family is lucky to get one roll a month. People wait in lines like they used to wait in lines to get bread or potatoes. Now they wait in line to buy toilet paper. And other things they ran out of. Last year it was milk. Milk. Babies 
don't have milk to drink. It's that simple. There is no milk. Now, the newest thing is soap. And the reason they say for the soap being in poor supply is when they ran out of shampoo, the people started using soap to wash their hair, and now they don't have soap. You have to see pictures, and they're all over the Internet, of the shelves in the supermarket. They're bare. I'm talking about nothing, absolutely nothing on the shelves. They have nothing to sell the supermarkets. The whole food process, everything, the whole industry is screwed up down there. Also, they passed a law uh, down there recently in Venezuela. It is against the law to photograph, to take a picture of the bare shelves in the supermarket, would you believe? But some people did, and they got them on the Internet. Again, I say, why do people keep Maduro in power? I do not know. Now, their biggest export, their biggest source of income is oil. We all know that the price of oil is down by 50 per, is down dramatically what you and I are paying, and a barrel of crude oil is going for under, for more than 50% of what they were paying last year. So they're not making as much money in producing oil as they did a year and two ago, which is adding to their suffering. Oil prices are not the reason for their suffering, but it, now it is contributing big time, and the people of Venezuela are suffering even more. Maduro right now, at this time that I am speaking, is in China trying to make some sort of deal that will get some relief and help for his country. Okay, I told you four weeks ago on the show, it's the only way I can put it, I told you, that a Chinese city by the name of Luoyang, L-U-O-Y-A-N-G, was doing a terrific thing. They were taking old banknotes, worn out, which were usually burned when, you know, bills are no good anymore. They burn them. The government burns them. Instead, they were using them to burn to make electricity so they didn't have to use coal. And they had enough used bills to burn. They didn't have to use coal anymore. It turned out that 1.32 million kilowatts of electricity is equivalent to burning 4,000 tons of coal. And they're doing it without the coal anymore. And I said, this is a terrific thing. Somebody ought to do it here. Well, it was announced this week that the Philadelphia Federal Reserve is burning money for energy, just like the Chinese are. Interesting, isn't it? The Federal Reserve in Philadelphia, they use the money, they burn the old bills to make create electricity, which then creates heat or, and electric power. Uh, so far, last year, they, and since they started this program, I'm sorry, and I don't know how old it is, they have burned 5,000 tons of trash dollar bills. Uh, before 2013, this trash money went to landfills. They, you know, cut it up in a machine and throw it in the landfill. But now the Federal Reserves are experimenting, and Philadelphia became the one that had the opportunity to burn the money for power. They burn enough old bills to provide heat and total electricity for all of Delaware County. Which uh, now brings me very quickly to the last topic I'm going to cover, free speech. Cop City, Georgia, police were questioning a suspect uh, on, the, on the street. Amy Barnes on her bicycle going to buy a pound of butter at the store, rode by. She gave the police officers the finger and said, fuck you, excuse me for that, using that language, as she passed the police officers. One of them arrested her, okay? And normally you don't arrest people for disorderly conduct. You give them a citation. He actually took her into custody, put her in jail for over 24 hours, part of which was spent in solitary confinement. The judge threw the case out of court. He says she has a free amend she has a First Amendment right to free speech. She can say that to a police officer. So she turned around and sued Cobb County and for violation of her rights to free speech. And guess what? This recently Cobb County settled with her for one hundred thousand dollars. That's the show for this week. I hope you have enjoyed. Uh, what can I tell you? It's a crazy world we live in, and crazy things are happening. What bothers me is matters are getting more dangerous as we go along. I thank you again for joining me. Uh, you'll be able to read this archive, some of you, on Facebook and YouTube by my book, The World Upside Down. And I'll be with you again next week at this time.